after the apocalypse, a pandemic survival story. A blood orange sun drops slowly into the smoking landscape of a ruined city. A virus has killed 95% of the population in gruesome, choking deaths. An old man runs. He and a large dog come to a stop amid piles of human corpses that have rotted to mere bags of bones and spreading stains on the pavement. He aims his crossbow at a moving shadow. A woman joins them. She is strong and angry, looking for retribution. Three survivors in a world of chaos and death. And they are looking for someone. Is their will to live stronger than the forces of chaos and evil that thrive as a new world tries to emerge from the wreckage of the old? After the apocalypse... A pandemic survival story. Available anywhere podcasts are found. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe... You can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, you can definitely prepare to be motivated and inspired as I am joined by law, lawyer and author, Stephanie Katsavillas. Stephanie has also had a career on and off Broadway. She's an author, a lawyer, and she writes about humor and justice and the resilience of the human heart. So we're going to be talking to her. She's from a multiracial family. So Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Curtis. It's, it's really a pleasure to meet you. Well, why don't you... Um, Start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself. Okay. Very good. Actually, I know you're, you're in the Midwest, and I'm a native Chicagoan myself. So we've got, we've got that in common. I, I was born into a Greek-American family, which perhaps many people can tell from my last name. And um, essentially, Curtis, I am just super grateful for the journey that my forebears made possible for me. Um, where I am today, sitting here, having been in the theater, a lawyer, and now an author, um, it wouldn't have been possible were I a woman in Greece at a different time. But like so many families, my family made it across a couple of oceans and, and, and made a lot of changes in their lives. Um, I think what, what inspires me the most is what they did to change their lives and to make room for future lives in the family and how many people in my family connected that to the law. I know that we're going to talk about my being an author, but as you've suggested uh, kind of in your introduction, the law touches my writing a lot. And that's in part because everybody in my family except me is a criminal defense attorney. So you can imagine what it was like talking at the, uh, at the dining room table at night. But it was, it was very tough sometimes and also very inspiring. And what I got from being steeped in that kind of family conversation was a real preoccupation with what justice means and doesn't mean, and how the law is sometimes different from what's fair to people and what's merciful to people. I say that because one, of, one person in my family is an anti-death penalty advocate 
He opposes the death penalty. He defends uh, clients who are facing the death penalty. And he does it for a lot of reasons that I won't go into right now, um, though I will say that it's in part because the system is so discriminatory. Um, But having known that all my life, it makes me think about what people do to overcome adversity. And that kind of infiltrates my writing because it can lead you to humor. It can lead you to inspiration. It can lead you to despair. And you've got to grapple with all those things as an author. So that's kind of where my family brought me to. And um, also, I had my first novella published when I was 74 years old. So I'm now 75. And I guess that's one of the reasons I looked forward to talking with you is I feel as though it's really important to take whatever you're given at your particular age and use it the best way you know how, because your life isn't over yet. And what you can do for other people isn't over yet. You know what I mean? So uh, that's kind of a a nutshell of, of how I feel. It started very early on, it meaning the arts in my life, which, believe me, wasn't the first choice for a Greek American woman. That wasn't considered what a respectable Greek American woman was supposed to do in my family. But uh, I think the die was cast when I was something like five years old. Some adults asked me, little girl, what is your name? And I said, Judy Garland, lying, of course, but I was in love with Julie Garland. I was in love with music and tap dancing and all the rest of it. And uh, my Greek grandmothers were absolutely horrified. But I ended up doing that for a living. I ended up, after I went to college, I ended up going to New York City and becoming a singer and actor on the stage. It was an opportunity that, as I said, I would never have had if my forebears hadn't come to this country. And um, my mother wasn't too proud of it for a while. She, she knew that her, her own mother would, would feel as though what I was doing wasn't appropriate for a good, well-brought-up young woman. So she told my grandmother that I was a teacher instead. But that all worked out. And uh, from there, I did become a lawyer. And I'll tell you, Curtis, I'm, I'm going to share with you why that happened. Um, you can tell that, that there was some pushback from my family on my being an artist, a performing artist, early in my life. But I did do that for 15 years. So I stood my ground, and, and that was a good thing to do. But there came a point where I started wondering whether I was helping anybody doing that work. Now, look, there are many, many people in the performing arts who do wonderful things for the world, absolutely wonderful things. I just had an experience that made me sit up and it kind of brought me up short. That was in 1985. I'd been in a Broadway show with, did very well. It had won the Tony that year. And I was sitting on the sofa with another friend who was in the theater and we were watching the Mexico City earthquake of 1985. We were watching the the terrible, terrible damage that um, the folks in Mexico City were suffering. And there were these people who were rescuing other people. And there were these rescue dogs even that were adept at finding people who were alive under that rubble. And clearly some doubts had already entered my mind about continuing in the performing arts. And here was this terrible event in Mexico City. I turned to my friend who was watching TV with me and I said to her, you know what? I don't have a single skill that would be useful in that situation. And she said, yeah, I don't either. And that's when I began to look at doing something else because I knew that for me, it was no longer enough to be on the stage. So I would say within a year and a half, I was in law school and graduated and became a lawyer. Um, That went on for a while. I moved to Maine after my husband died in New York City, and I translated law into activism in protecting voting rights. 
and into advising nonprofits. And where did the universe send me but to becoming the interim executive director of the Portland Ballet here in Maine. And I was smack dab in the middle of the arts again, but this time putting the law and arts together. And something said to me, you better do, do something about putting these two skill sets together because the universe has just pushed you into this position. So I began writing, I got accepted into conferences, and here I am, having had stories published, a novella published, and so forth. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. Well, tell us about how, because you know, Greek is is your first language, not English. Tell, Tell us how that affected your writing. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, I spoke Greek first. My parents, I think, were really smart in teaching me that language first. I learned English very soon after that, but uh, actually against the advice of other family members, they taught me Greek. The family said, don't do that. We, she needs to assimilate into this country. She'll be unwilling to talk. It will harm her ability to speak uh, frequently and with confidence. And as you might imagine, I think I was a chatterbox when I was born. So they needn't to worry about that. But What happened was that I got used to the sound of another language in my heart and in my head. And I really wish we in the United States introduced languages other than English earlier on in our children's lives. Because what happens is that you you absorb meaning in a completely different way in another language. I remember dreaming in Greek. I remember thinking that the most beautiful language in the world was Greek, that it was the language of unconditional love. And I started to remember exactly that when I was writing my novella. It's entitled My Xanthi, Xanthi being a Greek woman's name. And it's about a Greek immigrant woman who teaches a defense lawyer she helps raise in the United States. She teaches him about love's triumph over injustice because she has some very dark secrets from the Greek Civil War that she has learned from. Now, it's a story about despair, and it's a story about hope, and how this woman's love for her family overcame even unspeakable experiences, but I heard her voice in Greek. And Curtis, I was a little bit taken aback because that hadn't happened for a long, long time. And I started writing this piece by hearing, literally hearing voices. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I felt and heard her speech patterns. Now I was hearing it in English, but I was hearing her a person whose first language was not English. I was hearing her almost in the way that I heard my grandmothers or my aunts and uncles, many of whom never really mastered English completely. So I heard their sayings and their humor and their attitude about life in her voice. And so my job was to make her come alive to the reader without writing her in Greek, which I was no longer capable of doing anyway. But I had to find a way to make the rhythm of her language and the jokes that she told and the sayings that she that she used sound as though they had been translated from Greek into English. And I think I think I accomplished that. But it was a tremendous challenge. And it also It also made me listen very carefully to her voice and to what she was saying and to what her experiences might actually have been. Does that answer your question? That answers my question perfectly. Oh, good. (laughs) So the, the next question I have is, which domestic and global issues do you feel that your writing connects with? Well, as, as you might imagine immigration for one thing, um, the, the immigrant experience in my grandparents' generation still feels very familiar to me. And as time went on, I found out more and more about what it took for them 
to leave Greece and come to the United States and how few resources they had when they landed here and literally sold fruit on the street from a cart in order to survive for a while. So that experience is a global issue and permeates my writing. But I guess, Curtis, I'm going to call it not just immigration. I'm going to talk about displacement, which is different from immigration. Um, It can happen to you when you're displaced into a refugee camp somewhere in Syria or in in Asia. Um, the, The experience of displacement is something that was embedded in my grandparents' view of life. It's also embedded in my more immediate family. Uh, My late husband and I adopted our beautiful son from the country of Peru. My son is an indigenous Peruvian with a very honorable and, and beautiful heritage. But the displacement of his people over 500 years or more of colonialism and the displacement of the culture that was native to Peru when Europeans came to that country was something that that my late husband and I heard a lot about when we went to Peru to adopt our son. And it's something that I share with my son, um, and it raises that global issue of displacing one culture with another culture. And what happens to people, what the generational sadness is sometimes when that happens. I remember when uh, my son and I went back to Peru after my husband had died. And we went to visit when he was, when my son was a a 10 years old. Um, We went to a ruin outside of Cusco and we ran into a group of school children from the region of Peru in which he, his mother, his birth mother had been born. And he was so touched and delighted to see all of these children who looked so much like him. And so we had traveled there with a group. And our group of, of families, adoptive families, met this group of Peruvian children with their teachers. All of us were visiting the same ruin. And we decided to sing songs to one another. Our group could only come up with, oh, Susanna. And so we all sang that together. The Peruvian children sang this beautiful ballad about the loss of their culture and their their desire to remember the Inca culture and everything that it meant. And so it was really clear that that was still alive today in the minds of Peruvian children whom we met. And it touched my son very deeply. Um, That notion of displacement lives in my novella. It also lives in a story I wrote for the Mississippi Review. It was a finalist in their prize in fiction in 2019. And this story was about a different kind of displacement. It was about that terrible policy of separating children from their parents at the Mexican border with the U.S., and that policy that emerged in about 2018. The story is about a little boy who is separated from his mother. So he is doubly displaced. He's displaced from Guatemala, he's in Texas, and now he's without his mother. And um, I didn't know how to write this story for quite a while until it came to me that there had to be a figure in his life who could understand his pain, who was not part of the Border Patrol or anybody like that. And I settled on the spirit of his dead grandmother who came to him and helped him navigate this terrible thing that he was living through so that he could remember who he had been before he was displaced. Um, so that's how, that's how my work, I hope, interacts with some of the displacements that happen in the world. There are many others, I realize, um, that have happened in our country with people who came in the Middle Passage to our country against their will, the displacement of Native uh, Native Americans and so forth. I try to write from closer to what I know. Uh, 
And so that's how I believe that my writing interacts with global issues. So if you could pick a one to two minute passage from your novella to read, what would it be? And go ahead and read, read it for us real quick. Okay. I think I'll read you from the very beginning. Um, we're going to hear the voice of the lawyer, the criminal defense lawyer, whom Mike Santhi helped, whom Santhi helped to raise. And we're going to find out why he has to dis- try to discover who she really was. His name is Nick. He lives in California. And here we go from the very beginning of the book. Like the Greek grandfather I was afraid of, I'm a patient man with a wicked temper. The upside? Being pissed off makes me good at what I do. Death penalty legal defense. Lawyers like me deploy anger strategically for maximum effect in the courtroom and, uh, all right, occasionally at home. The latter with mixed results. Ask my Korean-American wife, Janet. I met Janet when she graduated from UC Riverside and had just started teaching third grade in California. This was about 16 years after I'd graduated UC Riverside myself, balanced a bartending job with courses at Cal Western Law, then signed on at the Riverside Public Defender's Office. Janet knocked my socks off, and I got lucky she married me. I've been apologizing ever since for bringing cross-examination home to the dinner table. There's a family disagreement? All right. Let's reconstruct the facts over the chicken thighs and kimchi. Then fix a hot laser beam on whoever's guilty of a contradictory statement. Janet's resilient, younger memory usually prevails, by the way. And my twin daughters? Well, I'm married late in life, so Maddie and Tessa are only 17. Unburdened by procedural niceties, they feel free to laugh at me whenever Janet catches me out, which makes me about as uh, effective as a fart in a hurricane. However... When it's a matter of ethics or my kid's safety, we're in a street fight. Then I win. Grizzled old dog that I am. Okay, I exaggerate. I'm not totally grizzled. At 66, I stay lean and work out so this lawyering life doesn't kill me any earlier than it has to. Actually, that's not true either. I work out because the motor inside my guts idles so hard some days. My RPMs jerk me awake at 4.30 a.m. when restless birds... Maddie says they're starlings, but what do I know? Russell eucalyptus trees outside my bedroom window. I spring up, comb my gray hair long over my bald spot, and begin living another day the way I think, which is project calm and avoid bullshit, with the boundless exception of my daughters. Now, Tessa's fomenting a crisis of conscience, and it's blindsiding me, stoking memories of my Greek childhood nanny, Xanthi whose packet of old letters sits in my drawer like an unexploded incendiary device. She died years ago in the Peloponnesus, God rest her. Meanwhile, I'm wussing out here, hoping Tessa's geyser of questions goes dormant amid my family's daily, messy, satisfying life. Me, hard-ass in denial, Nick Malonis, Esquire, sole practitioner, 4129 and a half Main Street, Riverside, California, 30 years serving clients in the Inland Empire, L.A., and San Diego. No frills, all facts. Wow, I could uh, listen to that. That, That's pretty pretty good right there. So tell us us about any any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Okay. By the way, I just want to say about that opening passage from, from the novella, what Nick's daughter... Tessa has asked him is, dad, how can you defend those people? She's talking about his clients. And as teenagers will, she's challenging him and he's got to kind of relocate his values, which brings me to the next project I'm working on. I'm uh, kind of midway, I think, in the process through my next novel, which is called Expiration Date. And Curtis, it's, it's about the death penalty in Arkansas and what it does to three people who get ensnared in it. Uh, This book is fiction. It's a a novel for sure, but it's based on a real-life event from the year 2017. I remember I was in my car driving 
here in Portland, Maine, and I heard a news report on the radio about the fact that Arkansas was running out of one of its, the drugs in its lethal injection cocktail, if you will. And in order to, uh, to skid in under the wire before that lethal drug expired, it was going to execute eight men in 10 days, um, which was appalling. It was an unprecedented rush to execution. People all over the country were objecting, including, by the way, associations of prison guards and law enforcement officers who had to implement this terrible thing. I was very, very shocked that it was for this reason that Arkansas would accelerate these executions, which I happen to oppose on principle anyway. So the issue wouldn't leave me alone. And I began to create three stories around this event. One is the story of the mother of one of the victims of those eight, of one of the eight men being executed and what it does to her after 15 years of Arkansas's not having executed anybody, what it does to her to have this whole thing brought up again. Then there's a second character in the book, the, that mother's best friend, who will end up going to Arkansas to witness this execution for her friend and will try to throw sand in the gears of the process. The third character is one of the prison guards on death row who is starting to lose it over having to do this many executions at once. And what it does, what this thing does to the people, not only who are killed in this matter, but to the people who have to implement the killing. This is all based on research. There are many, many stories about families who oppose, families of victims who oppose the death penalty. And it's very complex. Some do not oppose it. And there are stories of prison guards who walk away from this thing when they say, you know something, I can't justify doing this anymore in my life. And it sounds very dark, but what I found is that in exploring the lives and even the childhoods of these three characters, we get to find out what it is that they have hoped for in their lives and what it is that they love, what it is that makes them laugh and what it is that allows them to survive and get through this thing. And um, there's a secret at the end of the novel where they actually do get to throw sand in the gears of some of these executions. So that's what's coming up next. All right. Well, so people can keep up with everything that you, you're up to. Throw out your contact information, website, social media, any kind of contact information that you yes. have so people can check out your work. Absolutely. My website is www.stephaniecozzarillis.com. I'm going to spell that uh, for people, okay? S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-C-O-T. S-I-R-I-L-O-S. One word, no caps. That's really the best place to go. I'm also on Facebook, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm active on Facebook, but the, the website has a lot of information. And my novella, Mike Santhi, is actually sold only through independent bookstores. Um, it's a small press and we support independent presses for selling the book. So you can find that information on my website as well. Well, close us out with some final thoughts, maybe something that I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about or just any final thoughts that you have for the listeners. Okay. I guess what I'd say is something again about the great privilege of welcoming change in your life. I've been extremely lucky. I happen to know that. And change doesn't often feel good either. Sometimes it isn't good. Sometimes it's really, really painful. But if you can survive your way through that and get to a place where you can use who you are in service of the people around you, it's just, Curtis, it's the greatest antidote to feeling sad, to feeling despair, 
Uh, it is a great antidote to connect to other people. And I would give a special shout out to older women who are asserting their artistry late in life. I support you. Do it. You have a point of view that you could not have had before you got to this age. So share it with everybody else. Well said, ladies and gentlemen, stephaniecazzarillos.com. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, check out her work, her books, everything that she's up to. Stephanie, thanks you so much for gracing us with your presence tonight and sharing your expertise. Thank you, Curtis. I really appreciate it. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.